Hello, Tony Laird here again, uh, here for lecture four in our Exploring SMath video series. So in our previous video, we worked through a basic example with mostly all the same uh, units, pretty much everything in English units with feet, pounds, uh, etc. And we explored how to, now we did explore uh, how uh, to work through pound force versus pound mass in SMath, which as we saw is a uh, really critical uh, a real critical issue if you're working with the English system of units in SMath. Okay, so I mentioned there were going to be two examples, one of them fairly mundane, which it was, a very simple building, um, and then I said the other one would be fairly out of this world. And I was not speaking metaphorically, I was speaking quite literally. So this next, next one is actually chosen to be a little bit fun, and also to have some interesting calculations, interesting units, and some kind of some calculations uh, and combinations of units that we typically don't see together that often. So I am purposely selecting a problem that uses a ridiculous combination of units, um, although you might find the concept somewhat interesting. So um, this is a concept that I don't know if I, I don't I don't have time in this video to go into all the details of, um, but there is a concept in um, I don't know if you'd call it structures or speculative structures or hypothetical structures. There is a hypothetical type of structure called an orbital ring that theoretically could allow people to um, launch material into orbit for uh, incredibly low costs, far beyond what rockets can do, and also um, allow for throughput rates that are just simply mind-boggling. But uh, if you're curious about this sort of thing, I would encourage you just to Google the concept of an orbital ring. I think it's really cool. Um, for our purposes today, we don't need to get into all the physics of it, but I will say it, it, it's basically a, I mean, like I said, it's a giant structure, a giant ring around the planet, essentially. And um, it theoretically could a lot, could be constructed out of present day materials, theoretically. Um, at least for the level of analysis we've done so far. Um, and uh, theoretically could allow for much easier access to uh, space, orbit, etc. Now, we don't need to worry about that too much for this. This graphic is actually from the original Paul Birch uh, paper on the topic. But uh, for now, all we need to worry about is this, we're gonna model this as basically a, um, a giant ring of metal, a uh, continuous band of metal orbiting the planet or rotating around the planet. So that's what we're gonna consider. Uh, consider a, um, I'm gonna say this is a mm, one foot, diameter a steel ring rotating around the planet uh, let's say at an ang at an altitude uh, let's say oh 200 kilometers so it's above the Kármán line above the earth's surface again I think this con this concept is kind of cool but I don't want to spend too much time on it you can go and google it if you're curious um, an altitude of 200 kilometers above the earth's surface and uh, let's say it has, uh, okay, we have the diameter, we have the uh, altitude, um, it's rotating at a, um, at a tangential velocity. of let's say uh, eight miles per second. You can tell we're dealing with some serious engineering and serious energies just from this one term here where we have a velocity measured in miles per second. Now, for those of you um, uh, of uh, for those particularly astute viewers, um, you may recognize this is actually higher than orbital speeds. Uh, so this thing would actually, the rotor of this system would actually, that is basically what we're modeling here. And, uh, it would actually be orbited, it would actually be traveling um, at a speed greater than orbital velocity for its uh, elevation or for its altitude. And that's actually key to the uh, workings of the whole system. But let's not worry about that. Um, let's just say we have this big ring or uh, around the earth rotating at eight miles per second. And notice that I'm using this wonderful, just mishmash, ridiculous mishmash of English and metric units. But we're gonna show that with SMath, things are very possible. This kind of calculation is very easy. So what I wanna do is I want to find, uh, find the kinetic energy of the ring.
I want to find the kinetic energy of that ring. So this is going to be a rotational kinetic energy problem. Um, now, if I recall back to my basic physics, I know that Ke for a rotational system, and this is just a text box here, again entered by just putting a, uh, a quotation symbol and then entering text into the text box. Um, I know that the Ke, the kinetic energy of a rotational system, is one half um, I times omega. I'm going to use a lowercase omega squared, where I is our uh, mass moment of inertia and omega is our rotational velocity in radians per second. So we're going to have to build these quantities up in order to create these things. So the first thing I want to get is the mass of this beast. So first thing, I'm going to create a text box that, uh, that will, I'm going to use to label the section. I'm going to say, OK, in italic, uh, calculate uh, mass of ring. So again, we have this giant ring circling around, that's, that spans around the entire planet. It's 200 kilometers above the surface, and it's rotating at velocities greater than orbital velocity. So it's a wonderfully insane system, and I absolutely love it. Um, so calculate the mass of the ring. Um, first of all, uh, for this, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the length. Well, first, let's get some basic quantities. Uh, we want the Earth radius. And I'm going to define a text box for the label, Earth radius. Again, I defined, I created that text box by just pressing, um, first entering a quotation symbol, quotation mark. And I'm going to define this as um, R sub E. R sub E. And um, R sub E, that's going to be just going to be my radius. Um, actually, I'll use a lowercase r because for radius. And again, how I did this was I first pressed, uh, well, I first started typing R, then I pressed period to get my subscript, R sl uh, uh, sub E, not capitally because we're talking about a planet, and then um, I'm going to press colon to create my is defined as symbol. So the radius of the Earth is defined as, um, well, the radius of the Earth, now this is something you can just Google. I Googled it, and because I'm, I guess because I'm based in the U.S., Google popped back. The first thing Google popped back was a, a value in miles, so that's what I'm going to use. So um, the radius of the Earth is approximately uh, 3,960 miles. So again, I enter my value, 3,960, and then I want to enter my unit, and then I see uh, that MI is indeed defined as miles in this. And I just press Shift or Control Enter to define that. And because it goes blue, I know that I successfully defined this as a unit rather than some other label. OK, so um, then I want the altitude, the ring altitude. And we were told this thing was 200 kilometers above the surface. So again, I have purposely written this problem as a horrible mismatch of various units uh, to really make S-Math kind of shine. So I'm just going to say uh, altitude of ring A sub R is defined as 200. And again, I did this. I created that, um, that label and subscript the exact same way I did before. And then I'm going to define, I'm going to uh, multiply by the unit kilo, uh, kilometers, km, and then either select this by clicking on it or press shift enter. But I'll just go ahead and click on it here. And it now recognizes that this is 200 kilometers or that this, is, that this is in units of kilometers. And again, the real importance of entering a unit is that SMATH now knows how to convert between these. It knows that the, there are a certain number of miles in a meter, and a certain number of meters in a mile, and a certain number of uh, meters in a kilometer. So knowing those two facts, it has conversion factors that it will take care of all of our conversion factors for us. So we don't have to mess with units. Uh, then um, let's go ahead and let's see what the altitude. I want to get the ring radius. And this, I'm just going to let this be R. Um, I'm going to let this be R. R is just going to be R uh, sub E. Again, I'm defining a function this time, and it's going to be equal to the sum of these two variables. So I'm, set, I'm, say, I'm typing R is defined as, and I pull that up by pressing colon, by typing a colon, 
and then saying, uh, okay, I want the variable r sub e, which I can just select there or press enter for it, plus a sub r, the radius of the earth plus the altitude of the ring, and that comes to meters, although uh, I don't know if I want this and that, so um, I'm going to go ahead and put this in... I could do that in meters, I could do that in feet, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and do this in miles just to, uh, just because why not? Just to really illustrate that um, we're doing a bunch of uh, hidden unit conversions buried within SMAP. And I don't like that many, uh, I don't like that many um, uh, decimal places, so I'm just going to do, um, let's say zeros. That seems about right. Then, um, so we have our radius. And uh, we then need to find our ring mass. Okay, so uh, we need our ring, um, and uh, the reason that we need to get our ring mass is that's important for the formula for the um, rotational mass moment of inertia of a uh, spinning hoop. So um, here, um, what I want to do is I want to calculate the ring volume. Now, um, since this is effectively a line, um, well, actually, let me first calculate the ring cross-sectional area. It is a ring a foot in diameter, so I can just say a is equal to uh, pi. Now, I'm going to come over here and just select pi, and it does recognize pi as 3.14. Oh, actually, the constant is stored as a lowercase pi in our um, in S math pi uh, times and again for um, well we have the radius of the ring so uh, well we have to be very careful um, we have the radius of the ring but then we actually have to consider this is the radius of the entire ring or of the entire hoop um, from the earth um, but ring cross-section diameter That's what our um, that's what our one foot diameter is. So I'm going to say d sub r. I'm going to define that as one foot. So um, our ring cross sectional area then is going to be pi times dr squared over four, and that comes to 0.073 meters squared. And I like being uh, I'm going to uh, uh, just gleefully convert to all sorts of incompatible, not incompatible, but um, confusing units here. So I like using cross sections and square inches. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to have the, uh, I'm going to choose to have the cross section of this ring displayed in, squ in square inches, because why not? I'm using, a pro I am using a program that speaks units. And so I can do whatever I want and no one can stop me. It's great. It's perfect. Um, anyway, so the ring cross sectional area, just taking the one foot um, and then multiplying by uh, squaring it, multiplying by pi and dividing by four is 113 square inches. Next. Um, and so again, if you're confused about what, what diameters and, and um, what diameters and uh, radii we're talking about. This, in this drawing here, it's shown as two tracks rather than a single uh, hoop that we're modeling. Uh, this track basically circles around the entire planet. And so um, the big radius, which would be from the center of the earth to the, um, to, the, to the center of the ring, that's what the radius that we're gonna need when calculating the rotational kinetic energy of this thing. Um, but in turn, if we want to just uh, if we want to know the mass of it, we should we're going to use if we want the cross sectional area, we're going to use the diameter of just the ring itself here. So we have the cross sectional area, and then um, I want the ring um, uh, length or circumference. I'll just say length for now. It's just circumference, but I think it's a little bit easier to conceptualize if I do it as a length. And so L is going to be um, two times pi, oh, I don't want to actually want to use the Greek letter, times r. And that equals that many uh, meters. That's quite a lot of meters, quite a lot of meters. So 
Um, what else could we do? Actually, you know what? Just to be extra contrarian, instead of using a unit that makes sense, like uh, meters, I'm going to make things even stranger. But I'm going to put this in nanometers. Because why not? I can. I have S math. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> if I want this to display in nanometers, I can. So we now know that the length of a uh, length of a ring 200 kilometers above the Earth's surface in nanometers is that many nanometers. Um, Wow, that's a very large power. Um, anyway, kind of ridiculous, but this is meant to be an example that just completely abuses the unit conversion of, of S math. Okay, so we have our length, and now if I want to calculate the ring volume, I can go, and, so this is the actual volume of steel that is spinning around the earth, and to do that, I just multiply the area times the length. So V for volume, and is defined as A times L. And I have a total volume of that many cubic meters. And to, um, I imagine all of my friends out there who are used to having metric units are having a heart attack right about now. So I'm gonna calm your, uh, I'm gonna calm your pulse rates down a bit by leaving this in cubic meters. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and leave that in cubic meters. Um, but we'll, but uh, don't get too comfortable. We'll, we'll be messing with units a bit more as time goes on. So we have the ring volume. Now, um, I could go up, now this is where things are gonna get even more fun because uh, off the top of my head, I don't know the density of steel. Um, now that may seem strange, I am a structural engineer. I've, do I've, done, I've designed plenty of things made of steel. There's plenty of things out there in the real world that I've designed that are in fact made of steel. But again, I come from a uh, good old uh, freedom land, good old US of A, and so, um, I think, personally, I think in English units. And what I know about steel at the top of my head, and I could go and Google it, but that, where's the fun in that? Um, I know that steel has a density, or more specifically, a specific weight of 490 pounds per cubic foot. So that's what I'm gonna use. And I'm just gonna torture SMath into calculating a uh, weight from that. So let's do this. So steel specific, weight. So steel has a specific weight of, um, I'm going to use a variable of, let's say gamma for specific weight. Specific weight, again, I, I first entered my initial variable, gamma, press a period for to get create the subscript, gamma sub s, and I'm going to use 490, and I might be tempted to do this, but that's going to be a problem. Because, as we remember from the previous lecture, S math, if you just enter pounds, is going to want to do pound mass. But and that but that is not correct for this. I the, the, the value I remember off the top of my head, the 490 pounds per cubic foot, that is a force measurement. So I need to use pound force. And again, I, I enter my pound force, and then I click shift enter to, to select it. And then I divide by foot. Shift enter to enter it, and then put to the third power. And uh, to uh, uh, lower the pul lower the uh, pulse rates of everyone in uh, metric land out there, uh, I'm going to go ahead and display this in newtons per cubic meter. There we go. That's uh, well, that's an ugly unit, but 490 is just so much more elegant. Such a shorter number. The problem with, the, you know, I do like the metric system for a lot of things, and it is, especially for certain things like, uh, oh, I don't know, when you're doing pressures and that kind of thing, but, um, but man, this 490 is so much more of a human-sized number, but anyway, let's not worry about such things. <laughs> so yes, we now have a specific weight. Now, if we want to actually calculate the mass of something, though, we need to go and convert this to a density. And if we remember back to our basic physics or our fluid mechanics or whatever, or what have you, I need to get a steel density. And so a steel density, I'm going to use my variable rho, sub s. And um, if you remember back to, to basic uh, relationships of weight and density or specific weight and density, um, we know that we can use the same kind of method. Basically, we know that um, if we divide by meters per second squared, um, or basically gamma equals rho times g. If you remember that, 
um, if, or if I were to write this out in a, um, in a text box, I would have something like this, gamma equals uh, rho times g, where gamma is our specific weight, rho is our density, and g is our acceleration due to gravity. So to get rho back, I just divide gamma by g. Or in other words, gamma sub s divided by, now let's see, does it, ha does it recognize lowercase g? No, it does not. That, not. that is not something built into this. Um, you, you could define it as a custom unit, that would be for a custom value. But um, instead, I'm just going to use uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. No, wait, that would make too much sense. I'm going to use 32.2 feet per second squared. <laughs> and, ever, and the pulse rate of everyone around the planet is shot through the roof. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Uh, feet per second squared because I'm a monster. Okay, so rho sub s is then equal to this, and we get a density of kilograms per cubic meter. Um, or we could put that as pound mass per cubic meter, but I'll go ahead and leave that as kilograms per cubic meter for now. So we have a density of steel of that many kilograms per cubic meter. All right, what's next? So we know the volume of this ring, and we know its density, so if I want to find the mass, and I'm just going to, oh, well, let me enter a text box to define the mass, or to label the mass, and m is just going to equal v times rho sub s. And that's going to be that many kilograms. Oh my god, that is a very heavy ring. Um, well, I guess that shouldn't be surprising if you have a one foot diameter steel ring around the entire planet. That is going to be quite heavy indeed. Now, if you think that number is big, wait until we spin this thing up to eight miles per second. This is going to get insane. So, um, and if I wanted to uh, display this in English units, I could as well. I could say M now. I'm not going to redefine it. I'm just going to put M equals. I'm just going to say, okay, just give me the value back again. And I don't want kilograms. I want pound um, mass. So you're going to have to use pound mass here. Um, and it's that money, that, that, that quantity of pound mass. Or I wonder, ah, and that dyne is a force. Never mind, dyne is a force. I'm an idiot. Okay, can't use that. Whatever, pound mass we could use as well. Okay. So there's that, um, and there's some other obscure English units for, for, for mass we could use, but honestly, in any kind of dynamics problem like this, I tend to use metric myself. It's just easier. Um, so um, we're, we'll stick with kilograms for now. Let's just get rid of that. That's ugly. I hate pound mass. Um, so uh, kilograms. Now let's calculate, um, let's go ahead and calculate the kinetic energy of the ring. Um, calculate the kinetic energy of the ring. Okay, so the kinetic energy of the ring, the first thing I'm going to need is the um, the moment of inertia, the mass moment of inertia for this. Of inertia of the ring. Now earlier I looked up the formula, or you can know it off the top of your head, it is I uh, m r squared uh, for a ring. I equals, and we can, and if you, and if we want to double check that, we can. How, where I got that was, again, I just used a very simple source. I just went to um, mass moment of inertia table. I went to good old Wikipedia, which is always a reliable source and went here and found, okay, for a thin circular loop of radius r and mass m, and if you have a, a thin, if you have a ring that is a foot thick, but is that but has a, a, a diameter measured in thousands of miles, I'm pretty sure our thin ring condition applies, and we are rotating about the z-axis here, so we have a moment of inertia of mr squared. And so all we just do is take our variable m, and then multiply by um, R, where is our radius? R here, R squared. And we get that many, uh, oh my goodness, that is a gigantic number. Okay, um, 
mr squared. So we have that many kilograms per square meter. And I could go and do this in, um, I could convert this back to English units, but I don't want to look at pound mass again. It really annoys me and terrifies me. So I'm just going to do the rest of this in metric because why not? Um, if you really want to convert that to pound mass, you can do so if you wish. <laughs> okay. Um, so although we will uh, have some fun at, with the final energy unit at the end, I'll show you that. Um, so let's see. Um, mass molar of inertia. So we have the molar of inertia of the entire ring. Now, um, the formula for kinetic energy in a rotational system, if you recall, is one half i omega squared, sort of the uh, rotational equivalent of one half mv squared. So we need to calculate our uh, v, or, or sorry, our omega. And if I recall back from dynamics, I know that v, I'll put this as a text box, so I'm not actually defining anything, v equals r times omega. V is r omega, or in turn, omega equals v over r. So, um, our, uh, then our rotational velocity of ring. And it's actually not going to be very high because this is, yes, it's moving at eight miles per second, but it is actually not going to be rotating that fast in radians per second. Now, did I actually, I haven't actually defined the velocity anywhere, so I'll need to do that first. Um, I believe so. Let me double check. Did I define that anywhere? No, I didn't. So I'll, just, I'll go ahead and say tangential ring, tangential velocity. And I'm going to use lowercase v for this. v equals 8 miles per second. That is a terrifying number. Good God, the very idea of something that big, that heavy, moving that fast is... Wow. Um, anyway, um, so rotational velocity of the ring, though, this will be a nice lower number. And again, I am putting in, I, I guess I lied and I said I'm not going to do everything in metric. I'm going to do some things in metric. Um, so, but again, it doesn't matter. I'm using S math. I can use whatever units I want as long as they make sense. As long as the units have the right dimensions to work in the physics equations I'm using, it doesn't matter. And no one can stop me. So uh, then omega is equal to v over r. Just like that. And we have hertz. That's not what we want. Um, we could eat now, basically the way, well, the reason it chose hertz was because it saw that the fundamental units were, uh, were just seconds to negative one here because the length canceled out. Now, instead, I want to use, it's more customary to use radians per second. And radian isn't really a true unit. It doesn't actually have a length or a volume associated with it, but it does know that radian is dimensionless here, so I can do that and it will display it as that. Radians per second, and that works just fine. So we see here that our, um, oh, let's see, five maybe, yeah, we see here that our um, our radial velocity, or sorry, our, yeah, our rotational velocity in radians is actually very small. But the only reason for that is because this thing is going around the entire Earth. Um, anyway, so we have that. We have our I. We have our omega. All that's left is to calculate the kinetic energy. So ring kinetic energy. Um, ring kinetic energy is going to be uh, Ke is equal to 1 half times Oh, and this V here, pay attention, pay close attention to this. And that notice as a reminder from an earlier lecture, these things are um, case sensitive. So this V is not the same thing as this V. I used a capital V for volume and a lowercase V for, um, for velocity. In fact, if I were to double check to see if I actually did redefine that, my capital V, if I press capital V, it still recognizes this as the old value. In other words, this didn't redefine this value. Again, these things are case sensitive. So one half, um, let's see, one half uh, I times omega squared. And oh my goodness, that is 1.96 times 10 to the 18 joules. That is a lot of energy, like more than I can even conceptualize. I have no idea intuitively how big that is. So 
Um, we can do some other unit conversions. Um, let's see, we could try converting it to BTUs. Let's see, is that gonna help? Probably not. I'm gonna ask it to convert this to BTUs. That's another energy unit, but I don't think that's gonna help. That's even, that's just, that's just as incomprehensible to me. Um, let's see, does, does this speak megatons? That might be a better unit, or kilotons. Can I display this as megatons? Um, no, I cannot. And now, um, I still, I do want to conceptualize this, but I uh, don't want to have to, um, I don't want to have to show uh, custom units yet. I want to do that in a different video. Let's just go ahead and uh, Google uh, uh, megaton joule equivalent. Megaton joule equivalent. 4.18 e to the 15 joules. Okay, so um, I want to, uh, I'm, this is not gonna actually be using, uh, uh, you know what, actually, why not? Let's actually do this proper. So I'm gonna show this in a separate video as well, but uh, if you want to define a custom unit, you can. And the way you do that is um, I'm gonna define a megaton. Megaton TNT equivalent. Oh. Megaton TNT equivalent unit. The way you do that is instead of pressing colon or quotation mark, you press just uh, just an apostrophe. Just an apostrophe, and that pulls up a unit definition. And I'm going to say megaton. And I'm going to find that as the value we got in here, 4.18 e to the 15 joules times 10 to the 15 joules. Now it knows what a megaton is. Um, so actually, um, that's still, that those aren't, that's gonna give a value less than one. So let's do a kiloton. And that's gonna be 10 to the 12. Uh, kilotons, that many joules. And so finally, Let's do ring kinetic energy in kilotons. And I've defined a custom unit here, a kiloton. And uh, so let's go ahead and do, um, and actually let's go ahead and rename this. K kiloton is too clumsy again. I'm just gonna say KT. And so then I can just say KE equals, and I'm gonna ask it to display this in kilotons. Um, okay, there we go. That made, wait, does that make sense? Um, no, that, that should make sense because it's still a, um, actually, no, never mind. Megaton actually does make more sense. I was looking at the BTU number instead of the, instead of that. So megaton actually does make more sense. Sorry about that. That many joules. Let me double check that. Make sure that does make sense. 4.18 e to the 15 joules. Yes. And then, um, if I want to get the kinetic energy of the ring, I could say in a, in a unit that, well, maybe I can't conceptualize in everyday parlance, but in everyday experience, but it's at least something I can point to as saying, oh yeah, okay, I can realize how big that is. Um, and so Ke now, the Ke of the ring. Let's not use these things like joules. That's too small of a unit for this. We need to use megatons. That is 469 megatons. And if you're not familiar with the unit of megatons, um, well, you can Google it if you wish, but a megaton is a unit for unit used. Notice I say megaton of TNT equivalent. That is quite literally what it sounds like. A megaton is the amount of energy released when a million tons of TNT explodes all at once. The only context this, we this uh, unit is ever used in is in describing the yield of nuclear weapons. And for context, I happen to know that the uh, largest nuclear device ever detonated was detonated by the Soviet Union, and it was the famous Tsar Bomba, which was about 50 megatons. So this thing is whirling around the planet with an energy approximately 10 times, about 9.5 times, the largest nuclear device ever detonated. Wow, that is a lot of energy. 
Anyway, that has nothing to do with S math. <laughs> so uh, it is just, I, I intended this just to be a kind of uh, silly example of how you could, um, of how you could use some of SMAS unit conversion features and how it can be used even in problems that have a horrible mismatch of units. Um, and for, again, uh, to, to, see, to illustrate some of its unit conversion functions. And again, to remind you uh, what SMAP is useful for, what if I wanted to change some parameters? What if I wanted this to be at 500 kilometers? Again, if I were doing all these by hand, that could be quite onerous. But since I didn't do it by hand, I just had to do change one number and then everything else changes. And now I have a new value here. Same thing if I change the density or if I change the velocity or anything else, I can change just one value and every all the calculations will automatically uh, cascade through. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this example, although admittedly silly and or terrifying it may be. Um, so if you're curious, go ahead and look at the concept of an orbital ring. It is actually very cool, uh, very cool of a concept, but uh, probably something we'll be building anytime soon, but it's fun to imagine. So uh, that'll do it for today. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And as always, thank you.